good morning. I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, this is the week of class presentations. I want you to know how much I'm looking forward to what you have been preparing. So that'll be really cool. Make sure you come to your regular lab section this week, all right? Uh, but otherwise, it should be pretty cool. We don't have a lab afterwards. Problem set six is not due this week. It's next week. Just class presentations, kinetics part one lab. Let's do this. We left off on Friday talking about half-life, and half-life in chemistry is the time it takes for half of your sample to react. So in this problem right here, we have 10 grams of sugar, and it's reacting somehow. And we don't really care about that in this problem. But what we do want to know is how much is left after a certain amount of time. And this is, again, where the lazy chemist thing, if you want, cop pops in. But it's just nice to control it. And what I want to do here is show you two possible ways to solve problems like this. I'm going to push for the second one more than this one, but I do want to show both of them. <clears throat> so if you have a half-life of 35 minutes, all right, one way to solve a problem like this is you can literally go through and see like how many half-lives need to pass. So if 35 minutes is the half-life and you start with 10 grams, then after 35 minutes you will have 5 grams left. And then once you go through another 35 minutes, or you'll have a total of 70 minutes, then you'll have a quarter or 2.50 grams left, another half-life here, another half-life here. And if two hours and 20 minutes is equal to so many half-life domains, if you will, you can do this kind of method. In our Chem 104 classes, this is the way that we teach half-life. So that we'll say like how much is left after so much has elapsed, and this number will always be like 35 to the x, it'll be some integral of 35 minutes. So if this time that's given is so much of half-lives, then you can literally do this kind of thing and just count it down. And there's nothing wrong with this system, all right, it works really well. But if the time that you want to watch is not like 35 to the X amount of minutes, this way doesn't work as well. So this system is one way. And you know, if you're taking a quiz and your mind is blanking, all right, this is literally one way to do it. So if it says like two hours and 20 minutes, you can then start figuring out like how much is left, half, 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 this kind of thing to figure it out. But in our class, in our Chem 222 way, what I would prefer that you use is a combination of half-life equals 0.693 divided by K, and also the first order integrated rate law. And let me write this up here once more. Natural log R over R0 equals minus KT. And this, combined with the half-life to K reaction, uh, interaction, is a better way. Because you don't have to have like so many half-lives. You can have any amount of time and figure it out. So a better way to do this one, all right, is let's start converting things over and figuring out what's going on. Now notice that the K that was given is in inverse seconds, all right? So if k is in seconds, then you need to have your time elapsed in seconds as well. You have to have the same type of time unit. So in this problem, if you take two hours and turn it into minutes, that's 120. 120 plus 20 would be 140 minutes. And 140 minutes times 60 seconds per minute, that's where this number came from right here. So you can convert hours, minutes, whatever, into the common kind of unit. So if you know the time elapsed, here's the rate constant k, all right? Um, here's the amount that we're starting with, and we want to know how much r is left. So again, the advantage of this way is that you can do it literally for any integral of half-lives. It doesn't have to be a whole number of half-lives. Of course, now we have to use natural logs and the anti-logs and stuff, but it's a small price to pay for having the flexibility. Um, so on a problem like this, what you wanna do <clears throat> is you wanna first of all figure out what all of this is, and natural log r over 10 equals this. 
So to get rid of the natural log, you want to use what's called the anti-natural log. And so the usually like second function ln is the little e to the x button. So you want to do that here. That cancels out this natural log. And then you have e to the minus 2.773 equals this number. So if you take the 10 grams that you started with and you multiply it by this number here, that's going to equal r. And this is another way then to get then this 0.625. So this is a better way. It's a better way for us in the big kids class, all right? There's nothing wrong with the other way, all right? But man, this way works for any quantity, any amount of time. So there's a lot of advantages to seeing this. Questions on that? Half-life is really important when it comes to nuclear chemistry. And the last section we're gonna do to, on this in Chem 222 is on stuff like this. Um, this is an example of a problem where this kind of process can be really helpful. Hydrogen uh, has three isotopes. And let's review here real fast what an isotope is. So hydrogen is number one on the periodic table and the lower left hand number, that's the atomic number. And all hydrogen has one proton. The upper left hand number is the mass number, protons plus neutrons. So tritium has three minus one, two neutrons to it. It's a very unstable isotope. Um, some of the water we drink all the time has a little bit of tritium in it, but it's okay, our bodies are used to it, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, tritium breaks down into a helium-3, another weird kind of an isotope this time of helium. And an electron, which we'll talk about more next uh, chapter, is released. But in this problem, what we want to do, we've got 1.50 milligrams of tritium that we make in the lab, and we want to know how much is left after 49.2 years. And I don't know about you, but lazy chemists are not going to be waiting around for 49.2 years to see how much of this is left, all right? That would be silly. In our, in our lifetime as humans, that... Um, that would be ridiculous. So what we can do though, is tritium has been studied a lot and the half-life of tritium, 12.3 years. So we can use the half-life and this first order rate law to figure out how much of this is left after 49.2 years without literally waiting 49.2 years for it to happen. So natural log R over R zero equals minus KT. We've got the time elapsed, 49.2 years. We start with 1.50 milligrams, and we want to know R, how much is left after 49.2 years. But we don't have K right now. However, this is a time now where the half-life will be really helpful. Because in time, half-life is equal to 0.693 divided by K. So in this problem, we first need to figure out what K is. So 0.693 divided by 12.3 gives you this thing, which is the rate constant K, 0.0564. Notice that this was in years, so the K value has inverse years. When we plug it back up here, we want to make sure that the time and the rate constant have years. This is inverse years and years, but still it's in years. With K, we'll pump it back up into the rate order, or the rate log. Like before, we're gonna have to figure out the anti-log, all right? We have R0, the 1.50. We don't have R. We do have K and T, so minus this times this is negative 2.77. And E to the minus 2.77 is 0 0.0627. Now this number sometimes is used in nuclear chemistry. It's considered the fraction of the original that is remaining. So of the original value of one, we're now down to 0 0.0627. That's like how much is left. This number equals R over R0. And again, remember we have R0, we just don't have R. So if you take then 1.50 and you multiply it by the fraction, you get this number, 0.094 milligrams. 
So after 49.2 years, all right, our 1.50 milligram has decomposed down to 0 0.094 milligrams. And obviously this is less time than 49.2 years, so the advantage as a scientist and a human being. Questions on that? So here's an example of a copper isotope. Now copper is usually 63 or 65, but there is this random kind of uh, copper 64 isotope, and apparently it's used in medicine and stuff like that. It has a half-life, 12.7 days, and we want to know how much remains after two days. So if you think about this number, all right, this is uh, <clears throat> an isotope that uh, has a half-life, so this is the half-life, which can lead to our K, 0.693 divided by it. And we want to know how much is left after two days. And in this one, we just want to figure out like the fraction that's left, the R over R0 part. So it's probably not going to be zero, all right? Zero is very rare when it comes to half-life, because you keep getting down to half and half and half and half. We do have enough information. We want to solve for the R over R0 part. So we've got the time elapsed, all right, two days. We can find K, 0.693 divided by 12.7. And finally, to get rid of the natural log, you go that E to the X thing. So E to the minus this side will give us the value. And it comes out to be 0.073. So again, here's the 0.693 divided by the half-life. This will give us the K value. This is the time elapsed. We want R over R0. Here I wrote an A over A0, no big deal. So we're going to go E to the power of this part right here to get 0 0.073. Yeah. Is it better to convert days to hours like before we even start a problem or right after you calculate the numbers? Right on. Um, either way is fine. Um, tw uh, 24 hours per day is a good way. That's what I did here. But honestly, you could have done it the other way too, and that would have been fine too. But Dimitri does bring up a good point. Make sure you have the same kind of time. It's good. All right. A stands for the maps before and after. So A over A0, or R over R0, is the ratio of what is left, all right? Like R0, Joseph, is how much you started with, and R or A, whichever symbols you use, is going to be what's left at time T. Sometimes in uh, math, they'll use uh, RT over R0 to reflect the fact that R is how much is left at T. And don't be fooled, Joseph, A or R is the same. The, 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 the constants will change, but it's the same symbolism. Good question. Um, blah, 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 blah. There we go. Half-life can be calculated for zero order and second order reactions as well. And the difference between zero and second order is that half-life does depend on how much you start with, A0. So you can tell here I'm kind of flipping, and Joseph called me on this, which was good. I'm flipping between R's and A's, and you'll see them both, and our textbook said use both. So I want you to see both of them. But the important part here is that if you have to do a half-life or a zero or a second order, the initial amount is going to be part of your half-life. And this is quite different from first order. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, all right, first order is going to be the thing to pay attention to. All the radioactive processes, anything in biology, I would argue biochemistry as well, all of those things are first order. So first order is by far the biggest application. But if you had a problem with some kind of other order, <coughs> take on file, then maybe you might need a half-life from one of those things. And those would be things that you could look up you wouldn't have to know. On an exam or a quiz, I would like you to know first order things, because those are so powerful and so dominant. But on the other hand, on an assignment where you had something at home, <coughs> maybe then an alternative take uh, half-life would be important. Yeah? So where it says A right there, that's the same as the R right there? Yeah, that's right. 
you bet, you bet, Justin. Um, R and A's are used interchangeably in these, and you can tell I'm mixing them up, and I should honestly go back and change my words, man. But on the other hand, yeah, you will see it both ways, and it does mean the same thing. It's so good. Excellent question. <coughs> All right, um, radioactive isotopes have half-lives that are all over the gamut, all right? You have them that are super, super long, and you have them that are super, super short. Here's a uranium-238 decomposition reaction, and the half-life, 4.9 times 10 to the ninth years. So that's a long time, all right? If you start with 10 grams of uranium-238, in your lifetime, I would argue you still have 10 grams, because the half-life to get half of it down is so small, right? Um, we'll talk about carbon-14. Carbon-14 is used in carbon dating, and the half-life there, 5,730 years. Um, iodine-131 was released at Hanford in the 50s or 60s, went into the atmosphere. <laughs> anyway, don't get me started, but anyway, half-life of eight days. Um, Seaborgium, we'll talk about Seaborg a little bit, 0.8 seconds. And here's one of the newer elements, Rogenium, named after the dude that did x-rays, 0.0015 seconds. So I'm like, hey, Dimitri, look at my Rogenium. Oh, I open my hand, it's all gone, <laughs> all right? It's like so short, and that they can even identify these elements just blows my mind. Caffeine has a half-life, so it's not just radioactive things. Biological processes, a lot of times they will do, and the 3.5 hours number, uh, people debate what it actually is, and it depends on lots of different factors, but this is one value for the half-life of caffeine. So caffeine will be used up in your body, start to get out of it. All right. But the last big thing we need to think about in this section is what's called the mechanism. Um, so far, we've been looking at things that make reaction fast and slow. We've also been thinking about like some things are first order, second order, zero order. But the question really you should be asking yourself is why? Like why are some things first order? And why are some things zero or second order? And why are some reactions faster at different temperatures, blah, blah, blah? And to do that, we need to end, we need to start talking about the second big part of kinetics. So the rate law is something like we did in lab last week, and it's literally experimental data collected to figure out what things make reactions go faster and slower. But the mechanism, which is a purely theoretical construct, by the way, the mechanism will help us to understand why the reaction is faster sometimes and slower other times. And um, I have a picture here to kind of designate what's going on. This is a ski area, supposedly, in Vermont. And like all ski areas, there's probably some kind of base lodge part, and there's going to be some kind of central way to bring the skiers up to the top. But from the top to get to the bottom, there's multiple pathways to go from top to bottom, all right? And I know some of you in here are really good skiers and stuff. You probably just go like straight down, man. Go for it, all right? But on the other hand, I am a really bad skier, I'll be honest. I crashed into a fence and crashed into my friend. It's a long story. But anyway, I would be like, oh, going really slow there. Oh, oh I gotta stop. Oh, going slow, you know? So I, oh, I'm gonna go this way as mellow. Oh, Oh, all these look scary, maybe I'll take that one. Anyway, it would take me a lot longer to go from the top to the bottom than a lot of you would. All right, you just go, right, because you're good skiers and I, I suck, basically. Um, I bring this up because everybody on this ski slope is gonna suck one way or the other, they're gonna start at the top and get to the bottom, <laughs> all right? Some of you will do it in seconds. It might take me, you know, most of the day. But anyway, it's gonna happen, all right? Start to end, always the same. So the mechanism is kind of like the different paths here, all right? Some of them go really, really fast. Start at the bottom, bam, done, all right? Some of them, like when I'm skiing, very, very slow, all right? I'm not a good skier, I suck, so I'm gonna like, take the slowest, most mellow, I'll hold on to trees, whatever I need to do, right? But anyway, all of us, though, start to bottom. So the mechanism is like a detailed way of looking at a reaction to see, are you going like straight to the bottom, or are you kind of going through individual steps? And reactions go multiple ways. 
and we're going to figure out how a reaction goes from start to beginning. The other day, I went over to Kelsey and I shook her hand. I'm not going to do it again, but uh, one way I just went straight around, and one way I went over the table. All right, <laughs> embarrassing. Anyway, that's kind of what I was getting to. All right, all both of those examples. I started here. I went over to Kelsey, but I went different ways. And obviously, going over the table was weird. <laughs> all right, but it's another pathway. So the mechanism is going to help us to understand like why reactions are faster and slower. We're not just figuring out the mechanics of it. We want to know why they're going faster or slower. And it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> instead of a ski slope, which is much more exciting to think about, we have little pictures like this, and I want to talk about this. Um, this is called a reaction coordinate diagram, or just a reaction diagram or something like that. And you can think about it as you have like a start, which is usually on the left, and a stop, which is usually on the right. But sometimes start and stop are switched, all right? So sometimes we'll talk about starting here and ending there, but most of the time start and stop, all right? And along the way, um, there's usually kind of a hump, all right? And this hump we're going to see is really, really important. Now, over here on the left, we have this compound, which is a methyl isocyanide. If you look here, the methyl group, the CH3, is connected to the nitrogen. Excuse me. And that's not normally the way that these chemicals come together. Most of the time, we have regular methyl cyanide. So you can see, excuse me, over here that the methyl group connects to the carbon. If you were to draw a Lewis structure, all the formal charges here are really nice. Over here, you'd have some strange formal charges. So the reaction wants to get to this side. Now, this is an energy axis. And notice that the isocyanide starts at a higher energy than the actual methyl cyanide does. So what that means is that as you go from this side to that side, you're actually seeing energy released. This is an exothermic reaction going from left to right. This delta E, we'd be going down. That's like giving off energy. And those are the reactions which will usually occur by themselves. On the other hand, it's not impossible that we could take methyl cyanide and somehow turn it into the weird methyl isocyanide. But if we do that, we're going to have to add energy. You've got to climb up the hill instead of going down the hill if you go left to right. So one thing you can see right away from these diagrams is if your reaction is exothermic, which means going down in energy, or if it's endothermic, going up in energy. But there's more to this than just that. <clears throat> You're gonna see usually on these diagrams little parts of the how the reaction occurs. So the blue is the nitrogen, all right? And what it's saying here is that first of all, the nitrogen cyanide part is like going up. And over here, look at this. You've got the methyl group, this carbon, connected to the triple bond. Now, <laughs> this part up here is kind of like the science fiction part of chemistry. You're going to see carbon with five bonds. Here you're seeing carbon connected to a pi bond, which makes like no sense whatsoever. This little part up here is called the activated complex, and it's necessary to go from the left to the right or the right to the left. And it's always a weird spot. This is not a normal way that atoms come together. So it's going to take energy to get up to the activated complex. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is weird. This is weird for chemistry. It's something that happens just for a little bit. And it doesn't want to stay this way, that's for sure. So what happens in this case is if going down this way, it wants to connect to the carbon, so you make the more stable methyl cyanide, the acetonitrile, the common name. And you could do the opposite, all right? You could go from this one. You've got to make this science fiction connected triple bond, pi bond, methyl weird thing. And then you go back to this one. This value right here, which gets the symbol E sub A, is called the activation energy, or energy of activation. And that is so important to us. We're going to talk about that. 
But what it is for us right now is that if you want to go from this to this, you're going to have to pay this cost first, this energy cost. Once you get to the top, you're going to make all that energy back plus some more in this case, which is really cool. But the energy of activation, it's a necessary energy to make the reaction occur. You have an energy of activation going right to left as well. It would be both this energy and this energy. So going right to left, the energy of activation would be both of these lines. But going left to right, you can see you've got a smaller energy of activation. This energy is super important for reactions. And it's kind of like thinking about, uh, I don't know, you've got a can of uh, iced tea and you want to you wanna drink it, you have to pop the top, it takes a little bit of energy, all right? That's kind of a real world equivalent of this energy of activation. It's always a positive number, it doesn't matter which way you go. It's an endothermic cost that has to be paid in order to go from reactants to products. Questions, Dimitri? So, the more activated energy you add, the more unstable the reaction becomes? Good question. Not necessarily, all right? So, for example, the stability really comes from the difference between where you start and where you end, all right? The difference of this height, though, Dimitri, makes it easier and harder for reactions to go, all right? So, like, for example, if there was a small brick, I could jump over it, no problem, <laughs> and that's not a big deal. On the other hand, I got on top of the thing, oh, you know, I'm not, anyway, I should go to the gym more. Anyway, the video audience is probably laughing at Anyway, it takes me more energy to get up there, right? So I had to, like, think about it, and man, oh, man, if it was higher up, I have to climb, oh, then I might not want to do it. So it's more like likely to occur as this barrier gets lower, and it's less likely to occur as the barrier gets higher. That's where the value of this is. Yes, Alicia? So if you see this type of graph, will we like meet the solution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It describes how you would go from reactants to products. And you're right, heating it is usually the first step because heat is a way to overcome this barrier, all right? Adding energy makes it easier to get over the barrier than if you didn't have. Uh, would the, would the uh, graph itself change if we change the median or the, what do you call it? Basically the, med the median? Yeah, of the let's, let's go a little further, and I think the answer is yes, but let me go a little bit further, and we'll come back to your question. Okay, so these reaction coordinate diagrams are really cool. And again, what I wanna point out is that in this case, if we go left to right, you end up having a lowering of energy, and that means it's exothermic. But there's nothing wrong with going from the right to the left. And like we've talked about so much about thermodynamics, if one way is exothermic, the opposite way is going to be endothermic. And that's what we're seeing here. All right, even if you start down here, you still have to pay this energy, but you have to pay overall this much energy. It's endothermic. On the other hand, going from the weird iso to the regular cyanide, you're going to get energy out. The energy is lower. This part up here is the weird science fiction part of mechanisms. Sometimes it's called the transition state. You'll have an activated complex, which is something really weird. You'll see carbon with five bonds. Here's carbon connected to a pi bond, which makes like no sense based on all the Lewis structures and stuff that we've seen. These are really unstable. They're around for just milliseconds, sometimes even less. But then once you get to there, then you can start going back down to the product side. The activated complex, really wild. You'll see all kinds of weird things. And this energy gap is really going to be important for what we're going to talk about. And again, it's called the activation energy or energy of activation barrier. And it's an endothermic price you have to pay to make your reactants go to products. Uh, I know of no examples where the energy of activation is an exothermic, all right? It's always endothermic. We'll see there's real advantages of that. Um, lots of examples of how this kind of thing works. Um, the activation energy barrier is really important. Here's a person playing volleyball, and they have to have enough energy to get the ball over the net, but then it starts to come down by itself. 
So if you don't have enough energy, uh, obviously it won't get over the net. Sometimes it gets blocked by the net itself. There's other kind of things. Here's a golf player, all right? She wants to get the ball over the mound. If you don't have enough energy, it comes right back, hits you in the shoe. That's happened to me multiple times. Like, yeah, you need to have just <laughs> enough energy to get it over and stuff so you can get to the right spot. Differences in activation energy are often the reasons why reactions are fast and slow. If you have a small energy of activation, it's easy to jump over and your reaction will go really fast. On the other hand, let's say you have an energy activation that's 100 kilojoules higher per mole. That's gonna be harder for your molecules to jump over. You're gonna have to have like extra energy costs to make it happen. So this is an interesting thing, yeah, that a lot of times if you have a fast reaction or a slow reaction, a lot of times it comes down to just differences in this barrier, this energy of activation barrier. Now, temperature plays a huge factor in all this and stuff, absolutely. So a lot of times then, the reactions will go faster at warm temperatures and slower at cold temperatures. K, the rate constant we talked about a lot, which is kind of the holy grail of the ray law, is a temperature dependent quantity. But it is because K depends on temperature, you can use those differences to actually find the numeric value of the activation energy. We'll talk about that. Um, this is a graph showing rate constants K versus temperature. And you can see how it really starts to spike up there as the temperatures go up. But this shouldn't be too surprising to you. Like, I mean, people make uh, hot drinks usually for hot things because the things dissolve better and stuff like that. Pasta is cooked at warm temperatures to get it. Mm -hmm. no. A solution containing hydrogen peroxide is added to one containing iodine ion and ascorbic acid. This is a clock reaction where after a small initial fraction of the hydrogen peroxide has reacted, a color change occurs. Color change from iodine. So this is like a room temperature. The same reaction can be performed at low temperature. Here's an ice bath. Under these conditions, the color change occurs after a longer period of time. So at room temperature, it was, if you can read it there, it says 54 seconds. And here's one at a colder ice bath temperature, one and a half minutes, or at about 90 seconds. So quite a bit longer to make the dark iodine color pop out. And again, almost all reactions are this way, all right? There's gonna be some type of temperature effect. And so reactions generally will go slower at lower temperatures and faster at warm temperatures. Um, the kinetics part two lab, which we'll do next week, not this week, um, we'll look at the reaction uh, from part one, but we'll look at it at different temperatures. And you'll be surprised how some of them, man, just go so fast, and other ones go really, really slow. Um, when you're thinking about making bonds between two reactant molecules, there's really two things that you have to consider. And this is just an example of a random reaction between ozone and nitrogen monoxide. And ozone is a pretty reactive molecule. The ozone can react with the NO to make nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas is in the pleasant. But you can see in this molecule, the nitrogen is gonna have two oxygens. Like if you were to draw the Lewis structure, there would be a nitrogen in the middle and oxygens one on each side. So in this reaction, the nitrogen has to essentially smash into the oxygen to make this occur. So what we're looking at here is a mechanism. We're trying to figure out like why it happens. And if you don't have enough energy or the right coordination, the right geometry, the right positioning of the atoms together, you're not gonna have anything happen. So let me show you these two silly videos. For two molecules to react, they must collide. If an ozone molecule and a nitrogen monoxide molecule meet without enough energy to overcome their bond energies, a reaction does not occur and the molecules separate without reacting. 
So this would be like uh, me saying, oh, hey, what's going on? Hi, chemistry. Then I try really hard to not do that when I teach because boring, all right? And hopefully my energy projects on all of you. Sometimes better than others, I understand. Yeah, that's right. So hopefully uh, you won't have that, but you can imagine, and I'm sure you've had classes that way where teacher came in, a little lower energy and stuff, not as exciting. So you have to have enough energy to overcome the energy of activation barrier. So in my world, I want you to learn, I want you to get down to product sex. So I try to give you energy. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Anyway. If the two molecules collide with sufficient energy to overcome the activation barrier, but with an orientation that does not allow new bonds to form, no reaction takes place. The molecules will separate unreacted. I once had an instructor, literally, he was like this, almost all the class. Well, class, you can see it this way, and blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't need to see my less desirable side. You want to like, see something that's interesting. And, and in chemistry, you have to have the right geometry coming together. Now, on this side, what's happening, oxygen doesn't need to make a bond to oxygen. If you want NO2 to form, which is what we're looking at here, you want the nitrogen to smash into the oxygen. So this is an example where your geometry is meant up. Here there was the right geometry, but not enough energy. Here you've got enough energy, not the right geometry. If a collision occurs between the two molecules with sufficient energy and the proper orientation, then a reaction can take place to produce molecules of O2 and NO2. So in this picture then, stuff in this diagram, you've got enough energy, the nitrogen smashes into the oxygen to make the second NO bond. This would be a type of a diagram, all right? Like you could have before and after. Um, I happen to know this is exothermic. This is not something you'd have to know. So reactants here would be the O3 and the NO, and down here on this side, you'd have O2 and NO2. The energy has to happen because of this part to get that energy of activation to get those reactants started. The orientation stuff is because of the transition state or the activated complex. If it's not oriented just right, you can't have this reaction go forward either. And yes, in theory, it's possible to go from O2 and NO2 back to O3 and NO. But two problems here. Number one, much higher energy of activation, all right? This one was high, this one is much higher, all right? And you've gotta pay that cost in order to go from this side, the O2 and the NO2, back to the O3 and the NO. Also, this way is endothermic, all right? You're going from a lower state to a higher state. You've gotta pay that energy difference to go back there. When we went O3 and NO to O2 and NO, it was going downhill, so it was exothermic and you had energy being released. Yeah. Is there such a thing as over-sufficient activation energy? You can always have more energy, you bet. Okay. That's right, that's right. Absolutely, like in a sun or something like that. See, Where does the excess activation energy go? Is it released as heat, you know, like after the activation energy? Yeah, totally. It can be absolutely heat. So like if you had like a solvent, it would go around there. But you could also have like the molecules like rotating and vibrating and moving around more and stuff. I suspect that would be more likely, but I, I'm not honestly sure. So yeah. You're ready to have light too. Light would be another one. You're right. That's right. Exactly. These yeah, again, my, my best guess would be it was like vibration, rotation kind of things, but I that's a good question. But all of these are possibilities. You could have electrical interactions, but this one isn't electrical. Cool. So, activation energy and temperature, big time thing. The activation energy, that barrier, won't change. So as you start changing temperature, you're gonna have more or less energy to overcome that barrier. And what happens is uh, people start to realize this kind of stuff. And the differences in the activation energy will make reactions go faster or slower. Now this graph here shows two temperatures, the colder blue T1 and the warmer red T2. And imagine this is an energy axis right here. So imagine this random part right here, that's where you have enough energy to go from reactants to products. So at the colder temperature, you have a smaller area under this part of the curve. Those would be the molecules with enough energy to go products. 
At the warmer temperature, T2, now you have a larger area, so there's more molecules able to go react into product at the warmer temperature than there are at the colder temperatures. But again, like we talked about in the gas laws, there's always gonna be some molecules with enough to go from reactants to products. You wanna try and get, of course, the bulk of it transferred over from reactants to products. So, scientists name Arrhenius. So, I think he's Dutch or something, I don't know. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Arrhenius came up with this equation right here. And this equation looks kind of like a beast, but it's actually really useful. And we'll talk about how we can use it to find this little guy right there, E sub A. And I want to talk about where all these things came from. First of all, we talked about how rate constants K have a temperature dependence. And this equation is a way to show that, all right? The rate constants K, it will vary as the temperature changes. Um, R here is what I call the energy R. Um, if you take the liters atmospheres of 0 0.082057 and turn it into joules, which there's a way to do that, you get 8.3145. And what a lot of times people will do is they'll use it in kilojoules per mole. So this is nothing more than the other R version. We talked about this briefly with the clausius clapeyron equation. Here it's coming back. We're gonna use this R more than the other one. So R here, 8.3145. E sub A is our activation energy, and that's literally gonna be a positive number, and it reflects how much energy we need to go from reactants to products. And this is how chemists find it. Now, this is the anti-natural law, little e thing, and A is called the frequency factor. And I'll talk about what goes into that here in a little bit. Um, this equation is great if you don't mind the exponent, but a lot of times people don't like using exponents, and I don't blame them. So if you take the natural log of all of this thing, you get this equation right here. And this is the one that we're gonna use in Chem 222. If you take the natural log, you get natural log of K equals negative EA over R times one over T plus natural log of A. Oh, that looks really great and easier, Russell. Well, hold on for just a second because this is actually the equation of a straight line. Oh yeah, linear regression, here we go again. So instead of having this weird exponential thing, and a lot of you can do this kind of regression with these kinds, so don't get me wrong, but the way that we're gonna do it in our class is this one right here. And again, why this is cool. Natural log of K, our y-axis. One over the Kelvin temperature, our x-axis. And if we've done it right, the slope equals negative EA over R. And R, again, is just a constant, all right? If we want the frequency factor, the y-intercept equals natural log of A, and from A you can anti-natural log it and stuff to do it. So this is the best way to find E sub A, all right? Take your data, natural log of K on the y-axis, one over the Kelvin temperatures on the x-axis, do the regression, slope equals minus EA over R, bam, E sub A. E sub A is kind of like a holy grail for kinetic kineticists, all right? It's a way to see how much energy it takes to get over that barrier, and we can then predict which reactions are faster and slower. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit more about the frequency factor, because someone in here, Patricia, is going to wonder um, what exactly the frequency factor is all about. Give me a bad time. I was going to wonder about where these things come from. Now, there's controversy as to what frequency factor actually quote unquote means, but in my opinion, the best interpretation of frequency factor is this thing right here. And this is not something that you will need to know for this class, but if you're curious, all right, I want you to see where these things come from. So, anyway, KB is called the Boltzmann constant. It's like the energy R per atom. Don't worry about that, but in physics, this is used a lot. Kelvin temperature. Planck's constant from Chem 221 is coming back a little bit. 6.626 times 10 to minus 34. But this part over here is what makes scientists interested. This term right here, delta S, 
is entropy. And we're dancing around entropy a little bit in Chem 222. We're gonna talk more in Chem 223 about it, but the entropy of activation is sometimes really useful. Entropy is a measure of disorder. And if you have this delta S, it's how much disorder is caused by a reaction. And this is why scientists sometimes get excited by um, the frequency factor. They want to find this delta S. There's a lot more to this frequency factor than this. Please just cross this slide out if it makes you nervous because there's enough other things going on right now, I understand. But this is what frequency factor means. You can do some cool kind of things with it as a theoretical scientist. Questions? Okay, so remember, we're never going to use this equation, but if you're curious, knowledge is power. All right. So mechanisms will help us to understand why reactants go to products, and they also give us hints as to way to speed things up. Now, sometimes reactions occur in a single step, A going to B. And if you have a single step, these are called elementary steps. When a fluoride ion approaches a methyl chloride molecule, a bond begins to form between the fluoride and the carbon. The molecule's carbon-chlorine bond lengthens and becomes weaker. The energy of the system increases. As the carbon-fluoride bond forms and the carbon-chlorine breaks, a configuration of maximum energy is reached, called the transition state. As the reaction proceeds to completion, the energy of the system decreases. The transition state, or the activated state here, has a carbon with five bonds. How many times did we see carbon with five bonds in organic chemistry? Never. Never, All right. Uh, like I said, this is kind of like science fiction chemistry. I'm getting too excited here, I know, but it's real, you're gonna see some weird kind of things, man. This is a fluoride kicking a chloride out of chloromethane. So you're making fluoromethane. You don't even need to worry about that. What I do wanna show, this is a single step. So the reactants were higher energy, the products were lower energy. Do you think this is exo or endothermic? Exo. Exo. Well done. The products are lower energy than the reactants. Overall energy is given out, but you don't get something for nothing. You've got to pay this energy of activation. It's a single step, all right, and once you get over that, then you make to the products. Now, a lot of reactions are this way, a single step, but sometimes it takes more than one step. So in order to understand these steps, we're going to introduce these terms. These are called unimolecular, bimolecular, and termolecular. And the, a unimolecular means that one reactant is breaking down into products. And usually if you have big molecules, this is often the case. What we saw earlier was an example of bimolecular, which is when two pieces come together to make something else. So the fluoride smashed into the chloromethane. Those are the two pieces that made the products. Once in a while, you'll have termolecular, which is three different molecules coming together to make some kind of products. Now, termolecular is rare, and I've never heard of a tetramolecular, like four pieces coming together. And this is why. Let's say I said, oh man, I really want to go see um, oh God, Fantasy Island, although I heard it's really bad anyway. But let's say I wanted to go. All right, I'd say, oh yeah, okay, no problem. I'll go at uh, three o'clock. And then I say, well, you know, maybe Dimitri wants to go. Dimitri says, yeah. Oh, but he goes, I can't. I'm working today at three. Can we go at the seven o'clock? Cool, no problem. But then we think, oh man, maybe we should bring Brian. Oh, Brian's working all day today, but can we go tomorrow at noon? So you can see it gets harder and harder to coordinate schedules as you have more people. It gets harder and harder to coordinate those molecules to come together with the right energy and the right uh, and the right geometry. So I don't know of anything past termolecular because it's just too difficult to get four molecules to smash into each other with the right geometry. It's easy to have one thing break down. It's pretty easy to have two things coming together. Three gets trickier, but you can't have it. Questions? Uh, when I look at this, can you also have K times B to the second power, or for the the terra the yep. ter molecular, uh, K times A times B to the square. Yes, absolutely. So you could have like two Bs and one A. So that would be K times A times B squared. Absolutely, you bet. 
All right, this is going to be a good place to stop. Uh, we'll do more of this on Wednesday. Have a good day.